all free. Thank you so much for tuning into Cults each week. We look forward to seeing you exclusively on Spotify starting August 2nd. Due to the graphic nature of this cult's crimes, listener discretion is advised. This episode includes discussions of violence and sexual assault that some people may find offensive. We advise extreme caution for children under 13. February 4th, 1974, 9.10 p.m. Patricia Hurst and her fiancé, Stephen Weed, were curled up watching TV in their quiet Berkeley apartment. Suddenly, there was a heavy knock at the door. They weren't expecting anyone and glanced at each other curiously. Steve got up to answer with a shrug. A woman stood outside, maybe 25, with a hard, anxious look on her face. She said she'd had an accident and needed to use their phone. Before Steve could reply, two men burst into the apartment from behind the woman, General Field Marshal Sin Q and General Tico. They threw Steve to the floor, grabbed a wine bottle off the shelf, and smashed it into his head. Patricia ran towards him, wearing nothing but a robe and her underwear, but they stopped her short by slamming a rifle butt into her face. Sin Q yelled, keep your head down. But she kicked and screamed as they grabbed her. A neighbor heard the shouts and ran through the open door, ready to intervene. Sinku and Tico knocked him out cold. Within minutes, they were dragging a blindfolded, gagged Patricia down the stairs and throwing her into the trunk of a stolen convertible waiting outside. Patricia Hurst, American heiress, belonged to the Symbionese Liberation Army now. And this was just the beginning of their revolution against the fascist, capitalist pigs running America. Hi, I'm Greg Polson. And I'm Vanessa Richardson. And this is Cults, a podcast original. Every Tuesday, we look at a cult's practices, their leader, and their followers. Last week, we talked about Donald DeFries and how he transformed from a small-time criminal to a political radical, renamed himself SinQ, and started to gather a small but committed group of followers. This week, we'll follow SinQ and the Symbionese Liberation Army as they turn to a life of violent crime. At ParCast, we're grateful for you, our listeners. You allow us to do what we love. Let us know how we're doing. Reach out on Facebook and Instagram at ParCast and Twitter at ParCast Network. And if you enjoyed today's episode, the best way to help us is to leave a five-star review wherever you're listening. It really does help. We also now have merchandise. Head to ParCast.com slash merch for more information. You can listen to previous episodes of Cults as well as all of ParCast's other shows on Spotify or wherever you listen to podcasts. A new episode comes out every Tuesday. With a small band of radical Berkeley followers, Sin Q founded the Symbionese Liberation Army, or SLA, in the spring of 1973. Sin Q's political fire and alluring charisma attracted a group that was overwhelmingly young, white, and from a comfortable middle-class background. His devotees were willing to follow him anywhere. They wanted to liberate the oppressed and bring down the inhumane forces of capitalism. And Sinkyu convinced them that violence was the only path towards those goals. Vanessa is going to take over on the psychology here and throughout the episode. Please note, Vanessa is not a licensed psychologist or psychiatrist, but she has done a lot of research for this show. Thanks, Greg. While the leap from idealistic moral goals to violence can seem illogical, it actually fits into a common psychological mold. According to Tej Rai, a researcher at MIT and author of the book Virtuous Violence, perceived moral goals are often the impetus for violence. He explained, Across practices, across cultures, and throughout historical periods, most violence does not stem from a psychopathic lack of morality. Quite the reverse. It comes from the exercise of perceived moral rights and obligations. So Sin Q wasn't turning his followers into mindless killing machines. He was manipulating what they saw as moral. That was likely not an easy transition for them. Rye explained that morally motivated violence can be extremely distressing and traumatic for the perpetrator. Like many moral practices, it can require training, social support, and experience. 
Throughout the summer of 1973, Sin Q was busy giving his followers exactly that. There was the physical training. Bill Harris, or General Tico, as he was known in the Symbionese Liberation Army, would take SLA members to the hills outside Berkeley for military-style drills. General Tico was a 28-year-old Vietnam veteran. He'd been disillusioned with U.S. systems of power after serving in the war, and he wanted to change things. The SLA gave him the opportunity. His job was to train the group's members, harden them, and get them into shape for the revolution. They ran. They did push-ups and jumping jacks. They shot guns. And they loved every second of it. The Symbionese Liberation Army was preparing for war. Finally, the left was going to make a real change, and they would lead the charge. Thanks to Sin Q's moral training, they were psychologically primed to head a violent revolution. Ground zero for the revolution was the small house of 23-year-old UC Berkeley dropout and Sin Q's lover, Patricia Sotizic. Revolutionary code name, Ms. Moon. The rest of the SLA members were her friends. Before the group met Sin Q, they'd all been socially connected in the radical left political scene around Berkeley, and they were all frustrated with the splintered chaos of leftist politics in the early 1970s. Sin Q was an escaped convict with an ambiguous but compelling backstory. Sometimes he said he'd been a pimp. Sometimes he talked about his charitable work taking children to museums. One thing was for certain: he knew a lot about guns. He also had uniquely violent politics. He not only lectured his band of followers on the theoretical lessons of the Communist Manifesto, he also spoke about Cuban revolutionary Che Guevara on political assassinations and urban guerrilla warfare. He reminded them that the men running the government, the police forces, the banks, they were corrupt pawns of the crushing wheel of capitalism. But he went further than that. He told them the system was so broken that nothing but wholesale destruction could change the world for the better. His followers lapped up every story he told them and parroted back his ideas. They'd seen too many ineffectual protests, too many radicals give up and return to college or conventional jobs. The left needed some fire, and Sin Q was explosive. He encouraged each member of his circle to pick a revolutionary code name before they took action. And they'd need a manifesto too. Nancy Ling Perry, revolutionary code name Fahiza, headed up the SLA's writing efforts. She was a tiny, beautiful 26-year-old with an English degree from UC Berkeley. Her conservative upper middle class family was from Santa Rosa, California, where she was a cheerleader and campaigned for Barry Goldwater in high school. But by the time she'd finished her BA at the end of the '60s, she felt disconnected from those childhood values. She was lost. She dealt drugs, was usually high herself, and worked as a topless blackjack dealer. It was the prison reform movement that brought her purpose. By 1972, she was working at a Berkeley orange juice stand and sending all her spare cash to black inmates in Bay Area prisons, according to Brad Schreiber's book on the SLA, Revolution's End. Her activism introduced her to members of what would eventually become the SLA. She was deeply devoted to the ideologies of equality and change that underlay the Symbionese Liberation Army's beliefs. The group called her their chief theoretician. Some people have suggested that Nancy was the real heart of the SLA. Like the rest of her fellow SLA members, however, she was influenced by Sin Q's ideas. She came to believe that bloodshed was the only way to change society. One of the most important documents she helped the SLA draft was the Terms of Military Political Alliance. It explained what the SLA was, its purpose, and its structure. One part of it read, "Within the true purpose of revolution, there are only two deep purposes: to destroy the enemy and free the people." This in itself means the need for an army of the people that fights the enemy. The SLA would need a lot more than nine members to become an army that could destroy the enemy and free the people, but they had no trouble envisioning that growth. They talked about the SLA as a nationwide network of revolutionary cells, each of which would operate with units like intelligence, medical, combat, 
and armament, which would repair weapons and invent new ones. With these grand ambitions in mind, Nancy and the SLA wrote themselves a slogan, Death to the fascist insect that preys upon the life of the people. But Sin Q had more than just slogans for the SLA. He had plans. After a spring and summer spent writing and planning, in the fall of 1973, he amped up his small band's physical and weapons training. He started stockpiling guns. He even dove into some of the work of the future SLA armament unit, creating bullets laced with cyanide. The bullets would kill their targets with the cyanide, even if they weren't fatal on impact, he told his followers. But the excitement of philosophizing and training was disturbed by some stirrings of dissent in the fall of 1973. Sinkyu's violent rhetoric started to get closer to violent action, and not everyone in the SLA was ready for the bloodshed Sinkyu was planning, namely Thero Wheeler. Thero Wheeler, a 28-year-old escaped prisoner who'd served time with Sin-Q at Vacaville, was the only black person associated with the SLA besides Sin-Q, despite the organization's major focus on black liberation. Wheeler started attending some of Sin Q's impromptu lectures with his 23-year-old girlfriend, Mary Alice Seams, in August of 1973. But when Sin Q started proposing names for potential political assassinations, Wheeler became concerned. He was a radical and willing to consider radical action, but some of the people Sin Q was targeting simply didn't make sense. Chief among them was Marcus Foster, the Oakland school superintendent and the first black man to hold that role. Foster was a respected figure in Oakland, especially within the black community. But there were rumors that he was pushing for new student IDs and letting police into Oakland schools. That, according to Sin Q, was fascist. It was a sign of the police state oppressing students. Wheeler and Seams parted from the SLA in disgust. Wheeler later said he saw Sin Q as a hurt, angry man, damaged by the carceral system. Seams pointed out that Sin Q was an alcoholic. The couple empathized with Sin Q's passion for change, but they didn't see him as a leader. Russ Little, one of the SLA's first members, pushed back against Sin Q's candidate for assassination as well. Foster was a black man, Russ pointed out, and there were enough black men getting killed in America. Plus, there didn't seem to be much community pushback against the ID cards. Sin Q ignored Russ's concerns. He insisted that Foster represented the rich ruling class and big business, not Oakland's children. He was the enemy, the fascist insect. And in the words of the SLA, death to the fascist insect. Coming up, we'll watch as the SLA's bloody crimes plaster their name across America's newspapers. Hi, it's Vanessa from ParCast, and I'm here to tell you about my new 10-episode limited series, Obituaries. They're some of the most iconic figures of all time, celebrated in death for their individual achievements and impact on society. But in life, the relationships they kept tell a different story, one of unexpected connections that yielded extraordinary change. Every Wednesday on Obituaries, join my co-host Carter and me as we explore the shared legacies of prolific pairs from the past. From the mutual traumas of entertainers Marilyn Monroe and Ella Fitzgerald, to the unlikely admiration between visionaries Mark Twain and Nikola Tesla, each episode of Obituaries digs deep into the lasting impressions made between two legendary figures and how their entanglements changed the course of history. These meaningful duos may have passed on, but the profound effect they had on each other and us will live on forever. Follow the Spotify original from ParCast, Obituaries. Listen free only on Spotify. Every so often, something so impactful happens, it has the power to capture the attention of a whole country. An event so deadly or dumbfounding, it has no choice but to live on in infamy. Hi, Parcasters. It's Ashley Flowers, and I'm exposing the most sinister cases from the darkest corners of the globe in my new true crime limited series, International Infamy. Every Tuesday, come along as I guide you on a wicked world tour. 15 different countries, 15 infamous crimes. 
Take a trip to Iceland where six people confessed to a murder that never actually happened. Journey to Mexico where a Lucha Libre wrestler moonlights as a serial killer. And travel to New Zealand where two friends hatch a deadly plan to become famous. Each episode of International Infamy explores the twists and turns of a notoriously high-profile case, zeroing in on the cultural details which make the crime unique to its location, and explaining why it couldn't have happened anywhere else. Follow my new Spotify original from ParCast, International Infamy with Ashley Flowers, and catch a new episode every week. Listen free on Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. Now back to the story. After spending the spring and summer planning, writing, and training, in November 1973, Sin Q was finally ready to lead the Symbionese Liberation Army into the brutal action their manifesto promised. On November 6th, Marcus Foster exited the Oakland School District headquarters at the end of his workday. His right-hand man, Robert Blackburn, walked out with him. It was a cold, damp evening. Foster and Blackburn didn't notice anything unusual as they hurried towards their cars, looking forward to warm home-cooked dinners. But the SLA was huddled by the door, waiting for them. Police would say it was Russ Little and his close friend Joe Ramiro. SLA members later claimed it was SinQ and Ms. Moon. Whichever pair pulled the trigger, what they did, they did for the cause, for a better future, for the SLA. The guns went off. Foster and Blackburn spun and saw two muzzles flashing at close range. Blackburn was critically wounded, but he'd survive. Foster died. Eight pistol shots peppered his body. All were cyanide-packed, hollow-point rounds. Foster's brutal murder ran in headlines across the country the next day. Nobody, not even other leftists, could make sense of the act. The magazine Ramparts reported that it spoke for the majority of Bay Area radicals when it wrote, The act itself was brutal, morally unjustifiable, and politically incomprehensible. The SLA had finally begun their insurrection. They'd become an extra-legal force of justice. But their rallying call hadn't brought out the mass of supporters they'd expected. Instead, they were shunned. Little did the group know, Sinq had completely misrepresented Foster's positions on the policies that motivated his murder. But for the small group that committed itself to Sinq's vision, participating in Foster's murder solidified the reality that there was no backing out now. For one thing, the police were after them. They all had to abruptly quit their jobs and go underground. They rented out several apartments around the Bay Area to serve as hideouts. But there were likely psychological reasons they all stayed with the SLA as well. When people perceive their worldview to be under threat by conflicting information, for example, they think they've just killed an oppressive capitalist pig and no one around them is celebrating, they start to double down on their beliefs. Psychologist Leon Festinger described the phenomenon in his classic 1956 book, When Prophecy Fails, using the case of a UFO cult whose mothership failed to arrive at the appointed time. He explained, The group sought frantically to convince the world of their beliefs. In a series of desperate attempts to erase their rankling dissonance, they made prediction after prediction in the hope that one would come true. The SLA members doubled down and became even more committed to revolution, hoping that they'd eventually prove to be in the right. It wouldn't take long for their faith to be tested again. Two months after the shooting, on January 10, 1974, Russ Little and Joe Romero were arrested by a traffic cop and charged with Foster's murder. This only galvanized the remaining SLA members further. They had to figure out a way to get back to their comrades and continue their revolution. SinQ came up with an idea, a high-profile political kidnapping, perhaps a CEO, someone rich and powerful. The police might be willing to exchange an important captive for Russ and Joe. But it was reportedly Bill Harris, General Tico, who came up with the mark. He walked into the SLA's Oakland hideout with a copy of the San Francisco Chronicle. It was folded open to the society pages. 
Nineteen year old Patricia Hurst, leaning against bespectacled Steve Weed, smiled out at them from a large black and white photograph. Hurst and Weed were engaged, the paper announced. Sin Q and the other SLA members looked at Bill curiously. They had no idea what this teenage heiress had to do with them. Bill explained his idea. Patricia was a powerful pawn, whether or not the police would take her in exchange for Russ and Joe. Kidnapping her would get the SLA an enormous amount of publicity, even more than the killing of Marcus Foster. And she was certainly a part of the fascist ruling class. The Hearsts were enormously wealthy. Their hands were all over the media. Patricia Hearst made a good mark. Over the course of the next month, SLA members cased Patricia's home. They learned her schedule and when she was likely to be home with her guard down. Patricia would later say that in the weeks leading up to February 4, 1974, she could not shake off this heavy, oppressive feeling that something was not right. Sin Q, Harris, and one of the women, either Ms. Moon or SLA member Angela Atwood, according to different accounts, struck at 9 p.m. on February 4th. They knocked out Patricia with the butt of a gun, tied her up, and threw her in the trunk of a stolen convertible. The plan went off without a hitch. By 10 p.m., they had Hearst back at their hideout in Daly City, outside San Francisco. On February 7th, they released a recorded missive to the press. They had Patricia Hearst. They would kill her if anyone came looking for her. The Hearsts should stand by for instructions if they ever wanted to see their daughter again. The police, it quickly became clear, had no interest in trading Russ and Joe for Patricia Hearst. But Sinkyu had anticipated that possibility, and he had another plan. The SLA sent a second recorded missive out to the press on February 12th, eight days after the kidnapping. Patricia was still safe. They were holding her for political ransom. SinQ detailed the SLA's politics, explaining their commitment to ending racism, sexism, ageism, capitalism, fascism, individualism, possessiveness, and competitiveness. He declared that before the SLA would negotiate Patricia's release, the Hearsts needed to give $70 worth of food to everyone in California on welfare. The Hearsts, desperate to get their daughter back, made an effort to meet the SLA's demand. They put $2 million into a food drive on February 22nd. That's nearly $10.5 million in today's dollars. But because the drive was hastily put together, it was badly organized. It resulted in riots in Oakland and had to be cut short. While it was a failure on a practical level, the drive did a lot to improve the SLA's reputation with Bay Area radicals and the left after the Marcus Foster disaster. The organization's intentions here were clearly on the side of the people, but back at headquarters, the SLA looked a lot less humane. For two months, they kept Patricia locked in a closet, often blindfolded, and only escorted her out to go to the bathroom. She was given very little food, and she was repeatedly raped by at least two SLA men. The men would later maintain that the sex was consensual, but Patricia Hurst was their captive. She was terrified, hungry, and completely alone. She was in no position to give consent. The abuse that she experienced in those early months of captivity, sexual and otherwise, had an immense effect on her psyche. Psychologists would later testify that it left her with a childlike level of functioning, low self-esteem, and shattered pride. The SLA members slowly broke her down with their treatment. Coming from a group of idealistic, principled young people, this kind of cruelty is hard to understand. The answer may lie in the insider-outsider mentality that Sinkyu constantly emphasized in his lectures and that Nancy wrote out for him in the SLA's literature. Patricia Hurst, as a privileged, apolitical heiress, was definitely an outsider in the SLA's philosophy. She was part of the fascist insect, just like Foster was, according to Sinkyu. SLA members were conditioned to hate that fascist insect, and this type of hateful conditioning can make good people do terrible things. Barit Brogard, a doctor of both medicine and philosophy, has written about this effect in the context of the Holocaust. 
she explained the reason ordinary Germans could participate in something as appalling as the Holocaust was their perception that the Jews were evil. She wrote, They were taught that the Jews had destroyed the economy and that Jewish international Bolsheviks in Moscow were secretly scheming to destroy non-Jewish Germans and enact a communist coup. That doesn't sound so far off from the way Sin Q talked about the ruling class of capitalist society, which was oppressing and terrorizing black Americans and ordinary people. While the politics and contexts here are completely different, the psychology may have been similar. Good people do terrible things when they think they're fighting against evil. But Patricia Hurst was good for the SLA. Her kidnapping case was getting the SLA more publicity than it ever could have dreamed of. Every day, the SLA's name ran across the front pages of newspapers everywhere. So when the Hearst begged the SLA to negotiate their daughter's release, claiming they made a good-faith effort to hold the food drive, Sin Q responded with a resounding no. He told the Hearsts they hadn't even tried, and back at the SLA hideout, he told Patricia that her family didn't care about her. He'd come to an astute realization. If he could break down Patricia's connection to her former life and win her over to his cause, the already extensive publicity around the SLA would blow up to extreme proportions. It would give the organization validity, too. So commenced the campaign to radicalize Patricia Hearst. Sin Q lectured Patricia. He lectured her on the reason she'd been captured, on the SLA's politics, on problems with the fascist state they lived in. He had other SLA members read her the Communist Manifesto. The SLA, Sin Q told her, was the solution. He was, interestingly, replicating the conditions of his own radicalization. Patricia was captive, vulnerable, and felt completely out of control, much like Sin Q had felt when he arrived in prison, and he was feeding her the same political theories that had converted him to the SLA's cause. Patricia wrote in her memoir that one night, Sin Q came into her room and gave her this speech. In other revolutionary movements, when guerrilla fighters capture an enemy soldier, they sometimes give him a choice, fight or die. You can join us and fight with us, and that'll mean you can never go home again or ever see your folks or your old friends, or you can die. And she agreed. On April 3rd, 1974, she released a statement via tape. She said, quote, I have been given the choice of, one, being released in a safe area, or two, joining the forces of the Symbionese Liberation Army and fighting for my freedom and the freedom of all oppressed people. The options she laid out in the tape, join or leave, are different from the stake she'd later report receiving from Sin Q, join or die. The FBI officers searching for her, and most of the public intuited that she didn't have much choice. They thought Patricia was saying what she had to to survive, all while desperately wanting to get out. But the SLA took Patricia at her word. They took off her blindfold and let her out of her closet, bringing her fully into their world. She joined their regular fitness and weapons trainings. This newfound freedom opened many opportunities in the coming months to escape. But she never tried. She looked just like any other member of the SLA when, a few weeks later, the organization released a photo of her in a red beret holding a machine gun and announced that she had a new revolutionary name. Patricia was now Tanya, after Che Guevara's comrade, Tanya the Gorilla. They'd recruited their captive, and they were about to use her for their biggest hit yet. Coming up, we'll hear about Patricia's first mission for the SLA. Now, back to the story. On April 3, 1974, the SLA released a tape on which Patricia Hearst announced her conversion to their cause. On April 15th, the SLA moved in for a bank heist at a San Francisco branch of the Hibernia Bank. They needed money, and it was tax day, a perfect day to steal from the rich and make a point about the corrupt instructions of capitalism, from banks to the U.S. government. But Sin Q had another agenda, too. He wanted to show off Patricia, and the Hibernia Bank had cameras. As the SLA stormed the bank, 
Patricia stood by the door touting a huge machine gun, just a few steps from her freedom. But instead of running, she stuck her gun in the air and yelled, first person puts his head up, I'll blow his head off. Within 90 seconds, the SLA was out of the Hibernia Bank, saddled with $10,960 in cash, and Patricia was right in the middle of them. She'd proven her loyalty to the SLA to the public as well as to SINQ. Plenty of news outlets reported that Patricia Hurst had been genuinely moved by the SLA's cause. She was a criminal now, one of them. They suggested the idea that an exciting, high-stakes, morally-driven life may have appealed to her as a pampered heiress stuck in a dull existence. But considering the treatment Patricia was subjected to early in her captivity, it's likely her apparent loyalty was a product of Stockholm Syndrome. Psychiatrist Dr. Frank Ockberg, a pioneering trauma researcher who studied Stockholm Syndrome in the 1970s, explained the syndrome can develop when victims are subjected to a terrifying experience that comes out of the blue, followed by total infantilization. In these conditions, small acts of kindness, such as being given food or increased freedoms, can prompt a primitive gratitude for the gift of life. This gratitude can lead a victim to identify with and even love their captor. Patricia was subjected to a sudden horrifying experience when she was kidnapped. She was completely infantilized in her early months with the SLA, unable to even go to the bathroom without permission. And after she agreed to join the SLA, she was allowed out of her closet, fed normally, and welcomed into the group as a comrade. Clinical psychologist Dr. Joseph M. Carver explained this kind of emotional bonding with an abuser is actually a strategy for survival for victims of abuse and intimidation. Law enforcement agencies actually encourage it in hostage situations today because it can improve a victim's chances of survival, even though it can make rescue more difficult. Hostage victims often stop wanting to be rescued and can even start to fear law enforcement more than their captors. But back in the 1970s, the FBI was not thinking about Stockholm Syndrome. After the Hibernia bank robbery, they stopped treating their search for Patricia like a kidnapping case. They labeled her a criminal, along with the rest of the SLA. Meanwhile, SINQ was getting increasingly paranoid about police discovery, with good reason. He moved the group from one cramped, uncomfortable safe house to another, and rarely let anyone out of the house. At the end of May, he decided they needed to get out of the Bay Area. He knew L.A. like the back of his hand from his years working at streets as an arms dealer and informant. It seemed like their best bet. But his plan to lay low would be undermined when Bill and Emily Harris left their L.A. safe house with Patricia to get some supplies for the group. Bill made an enormous mistake. He tried to steal a shotgun shell bandolier at Mel's Sporting Goods. A cashier saw Bill trying to steal the bandolier and tackled him to the ground. Bill pulled out his gun. Emily watched in horror from inside the store. This could be the end. But Patricia was waiting across the street in their van with the weapon stash. She leapt into action, grabbing a submachine gun from the back seat. She shot 33 rounds at the store, aiming high to avoid hitting anyone. In the chaos of her fire, Bill and Emily both made it back into the car and sped off. They quickly realized they needed to ditch their van. The store clerks had seen it, and they would give the police its make and model. They first stole one car. Its engine failed after a few blocks. Then they stole another. But they knew they couldn't go back to the safe house. They weren't sure if they had a police tail. So they went to the SLA's designated emergency meeting place, a drive-in movie theater. That choice would save their lives, because Patricia had made a crucial mistake when ditching the van. She left a parking ticket on the front seat. Written on it was the address of the SLA's hideout. As she, Bill and Emily sat at the drive-in watching a movie, the FBI was closing in on the SLA safe house. But the rest of the SLA knew they were in danger. They were listening to news about the shootout on the radio, and they were worried Patricia, Bill, and Emily might lead a police tale straight to them. 
Sin-Q moved the group to another safe house a few streets away from where they'd been staying. But the FBI's giant manhunt finally had the info it needed to demolish the SLA. Moving a few doors down wasn't going to stop them. The next day, May 17, 1974, the FBI decided it was time to move in, and they had the right address, 1466 East 54th Street. A small army of FBI agents and more than 400 police officers pulled up onto the quiet residential street and headed straight for a rundown, single-story wood frame house. They circled the house and demanded everyone inside come out, but nothing happened. The news teams arrived. It was chaos, and it was all broadcast live on TV. Patricia, Bill, and Emily watched the confrontation along with the rest of America from a small hotel room in Anaheim, outside L.A. They were devastated by what they saw. The police threw tear gas into the house. The SLA responded by opening fire. The police shot back for an hour before they lost their patience. They needed something to break the stalemate which is why they threw flammable riot gas canisters in through the shattered windows. The cans landed right on the SLA's stockpile of ammunition and exploded. The roof collapsed. The house was engulfed in flames. And all the SLA members inside, who hadn't already been fatally shot, burned alive in the crawl space under the house. Willie Wolf. Sinkyu's first convert was dead. Nancy Ling Perry, the SLA's chief theoretician, was dead. Ms. Moon Soltisik, who first sheltered Sinkyu after he escaped from jail, dead. Angela Atwood, Camilla Hall, all dead. Sinkyu's loyal army, the army he had trained and lectured and fought beside, was destroyed. He had no one left, and without his fight, he had nothing to live for. His charred body was found inside the house, with a gunshot wound to the side of the head, likely self-inflicted. Sinkyu's life purpose burned to the ground with the SLA. He went with it. Inside the house, under the seared bodies and the fallen chunks of roof, the police and FBI found an enormous store of weapons and a trove of new manifestos. These documents made clear how grandiose Sinkyu's ideas for the SLA really were. He often talked about it as if it was already a massive national or even international organization. Yet at the time of the shootout, the SLA had only nine active members. By the end of May 17, 1974, there were only three, and they no longer had a leader. The SLA lived on for another year and a half under Bill Harris's leadership. Patricia stayed loyal to the SLA, even without SINQ in charge. They moved back up to the Bay Area, where Bill and Emily had friends from leftist political circles who could help shelter them. But the three lone revolutionaries were plagued by interpersonal conflict. They'd lost their friends and comrades. They were stuck together in cramped, close quarters under extreme stress. Constantly on the run from the police, they had little opportunity to further their mission as agents of political change. On September 18, 1975, the law finally caught up with them and arrested the three surviving members. Less than three years after the SLA was established in 1973, every member of the group was either dead or in police custody. The SLA had effectively come to an end. All that was left was the trials. Patricia's lawyers, the best money could buy, pled brainwashing and manipulation. They used the term Stockholm Syndrome. Public sentiment on the case was divided. Some bought her defense team's argument. Others saw her as a wayward rich girl who'd thrown away her opportunities for misguided ideals and an exciting life. They called Stockholm Syndrome an unlikely excuse. In the end, the jury convicted her. She was sentenced to seven years in prison for the Hibernia bank robbery. President Jimmy Carter commuted Patricia's sentence after 21 months as a result of an appeal from her parents. President Bill Clinton eventually pardoned her. 
Whether or not Patricia fought for the SLA of her own volition, she was welcomed back into the fold of life amongst America's elite. Bill and Emily Harris were sentenced to eight years in prison. They served their full terms. The governing structures that the SLA fought against so passionately and violently beat them down in the end. The FBI and police fired hundreds of bullets into 1466 East 54th Street and used riot gas on six young men and women. The SLA members that got away with their lives disappeared, along with many of the Bay Area's 1970s radicals, into conventional capitalist lives. But the SLA, and particularly their kidnap and conversion of Patty Hearst, continues to fascinate America. They've been the subject of at least eight TV shows and films, the most recent of which came out in 2018. And Patricia Hearst remains the poster child for Stockholm Syndrome. Amongst the drama, the blood, and the flames of the SLA story, what sometimes gets lost is the SLA's passionate commitment to a politics of equality and justice. The struggle to figure out how to make those noble ideals a reality is ongoing. And while the SLA may have been deeply misguided about how to make it happen, they certainly were devoted to trying. Those six bodies charred amongst the flames on May 17, 1974, will always be a testament to that. Thanks again for tuning in to Cults. We'll be back with another episode next Tuesday. You can find more episodes of Cults, as well as all of ParCast's other shows on Spotify or your favorite podcast directory. Several of you have asked how to help us. If you enjoy the show, the best way to help is to leave a five-star review. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Instagram at ParCast and Twitter at ParCast Network. We'll see you next time. Cults was created by Max Cutler, is a production of Cutler Media, and is part of the ParCast Network. It is produced by Max and Ron Cutler, sound designed by Paul Liebeskind, with production assistance by Ron Shapiro and Paul Mahler. Additional production assistance by Maggie Admire and Carly Madden. This episode of Cults is written by Nora Battelle and stars Greg Polson and Vanessa Richardson. Hi, it's Vanessa from ParCast. If you enjoy our in-depth profiles on historical figures and famous fates, you'll love my new limited series, Obituaries. Every Wednesday on Spotify, join me and my co-host Carter as we explore the unlikely bonds forged between two meaningful figures from the past and discover how those relationships impacted the future. Follow the Spotify original from ParCast, Obituaries. Listen weekly, free, and only on Spotify. Hi, listeners. It's Ashley Flowers, and here's a quick reminder to check out my new true crime limited series, International Infamy. Every Tuesday, I'm taking you across the globe to look at 15 of the most notorious crimes from 15 different countries. Some stories are sure to shock. Some may leave you stumped but all are quite the trip.